Welcome everyone. We're just giving it a minute or so for folks to come in and then we'll get started. Okay, well, welcome. Hello, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I am Toby Jackson. I am the program executive for the AIAA SciTech Forum, and we are thrilled to have you join us today for our discussion. We are eager to hear more about our industry's workforce challenges as a result of recent shifts in the way we get work done. And the panel will also discuss opportunities available to retain current aerospace industry workers and to recruit new talent. At AAA, we know workforce issues are top of mind for many aerospace and defense industry leaders. Discussions such as today's webinar offer the opportunity for our community to talk through our challenges and present concrete solutions. Building our next generation aerospace workforce will also be a key theme at the 2024 AAA SciTech Forum. SciTech is taking place January 8 through 12 in Orlando, Florida. And technical panels at SciTech include digital workforce development and ground test workforce retention sessions. From the main stage, we'll feature the Friday keynote and Forum 360 sessions, inviting us to imagine the aerospace engineer of tomorrow. We also have a number of diversity, equity, and inclusion focused sessions throughout the week. You can find out more and you can register today at aaa.org slash SciTech. So turning back to today's webinar, please note that it is being recorded and that the recording will be shared in the next two days with all of the registrants via email. Our panel will also be taking questions today and to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A tab. I'd like to thank the AAA Society and Aerospace Technology Outreach Committee and specifically Dr. Amir Gohardani for proposing and organizing today's session. I'll turn it over to Amir to begin today's discussion. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Just to make sure that you landed on the right spaceport, this is the U.S. Aerospace Workforce Obstacles and Opportunities webinar with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Now that we have established that, we a very warm welcome to all of you who decided to join us. Uh, I am Dr. Amir Eskohardani, Vice President and Space Thought Leader at Deloitte, and it is my pleasure to moderate this session. Before diving into the details, I'd like to share a, a little bit about the disclaimer that we have for this webinar. All views and opinions expressed in this webinar are solely those of the moderator, and the panel members, and they do not necessarily reflect the official views of any entities in which the moderator and the panel members are affiliated with. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome panel member, Ms. Digna Carbalosa, Talent Services Director at NASA. Hello, Digna, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Amir, nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Mike French, Vice President of Space Systems at Aerospace Industries Association. Hello, Mike. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Amir. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Likewise. And uh, our final panel member is U.S. Air Force retired Colonel Janet Grandin, Chief Executive Officer of Stellar Solutions Incorporated. Hello, Janet. Welcome to the session. Hi, Amir. Thank you for the invitation. Really looking forward to uh the discussion today and hearing what uh, is on everybody's mind. Thank you, Janet. So I like to uh, paint a little, uh, maybe a rough agenda for today's webinar. We start off with some rapid fire questions and the intent of these questions are really 
for the audience to get a little bit more familiarized with our distinguished panel. Following these questions, we dive deep into the obstacles and opportunities for the uh, US aerospace workforce. And hopefully we will have time to have a, a Q and A session following these questions. And we hope to also wrap up things uh, with some additional rapid fire questions before the end of the session. So uh, without any delay, I like to dive right into the rapid fire questions at this point. So Mike, Digna and Janet, are you ready? Let's go. Wonderful. So the first question is, and it's a little tricky because I was struggling to answer it myself. It's, it's only one of the options, aeronautics or astronautics. Maybe we start with Janet. Aeronautics. Digna? Both. I work for NASA, <laughs> yeah, it's so I hard, not possibly it? pick one. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to choose, right? Mm -hmm. And Mike? Well, that's why I work at the Aerospace Industries Association, <laughs> right? It's about it's about both. But if you're making me pick, um, you know, I've, I've got to I've got to represent space here. Okay, wonderful. So we have we have uh, you know both sides covered. So that's that's a great thing. Now, if you could try, and this is also tricky, describe yourselves in three words, Janet. Uh, family, patriot, and strategic. Wow, Dina. Um, inclusive, um, family, and mission driven. Wow, beautiful. And Mike, I guess I'd say a skeptical optimist, uh, carbon based. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> very insightful. Love it. All right, so then the next thing is maybe this is a little easier books or movies, Janet. Books. Movies. Movies? Books. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I, I love that we have, uh, you know, either one of the options in any of these. Now, the next one, maybe you can expand a little bit on your answer. And that is, have you ever changed your industry uh, or your career? And if you have, please tell us a little bit about it. Janet? Uh, I have. So I, I answered aeronautics for the first question because I'm an aeronautical engineer. But I really... When I joined the Air Force, uh, they put me in space, and that's where, where I spent my whole career. So I feel like I've changed industries from aero to aeronautics to aerospace. Yeah, makes sense. Dina? So I started my um, career in the um, procurement and contracts world in the hospitality sector. Um, so building and um, growing um, hotels across Latin America. And um, then I found um, human resources and have just loved it um, ever since and um, just really uh, enjoy making a difference in people's lives. So have definitely stayed in that field. Wonderful. And I love that you painted that trajectory for us that there is you don't necessarily need to start in the aerospace sector and to just join it some, sometime in the future. So love it. Mike? Uh, not as diverse of, of a path, but uh, certainly some uh, twists and turns. Uh, always interested in aerospace. I started as an aerospace lawyer, um, but through government service, ended up uh, for a bit of time in different agencies. So I worked um, in campaign finance law uh, for a bit at the Federal Election Commission. I worked uh, on environmental law for a bit at the Department of Interior, uh, and then returned back uh, to, to aerospace work at NASA and, and since then. Yeah, and I love that that you said that you were working on aerospace law. And that's another element that I think stands out that typically when we think about the aerospace field, we don't necessarily think law. But there's definitely a very important element to that. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm so thrilled to have these discussions with you. When I was actually trying to craft this webinar, one of the key questions that popped into my mind was, why do we need to discuss the US aerospace workforce at this point in time or now? And there is obviously a very uh, lengthy answer to this question. And in the interest of time, I just stick to the shorter answer. 
And the shorter answer is really that the aerospace industry, similarly to other industries, has gone through seismic changes and shifts in the, in the past few years. Consider, for instance, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, at different attrition rates, uh, aging workforce, work from home, influx of different technologies, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And as you can imagine, many of these factors impact the workforce. And really one of the intent and objectives of this webinar is to scratch the surface on some of these areas. Now, bear in mind that many of these topics are infinite in scope, and we have finite time for this webinar. We will try to do our very best to at least address some of the obstacles and opportunities, and at least have some key takeaways with, uh, with our discussions here. So again, very warm welcome to our session. I'd like to start the very first question, and maybe we can go in the order of Janet and Digna and Mike, as we have done in the, in the previous questions. And the first question is really, what are some of the challenges of the US aerospace workforce that you recorded in your organization before the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Amir. That's, that's a great question. Um, so just a little bit about our workforce, I think it probably is instructive to, to hear this answer, but um, you know, Stellar Solutions was founded 28 years ago by Celeste Ford, who was an experienced aerospace engineer, and she built the company so that people could be in their dream jobs solving customer critical needs. And that's how we built our workforce before the pandemic is how we're doing it now. Um, and so we've always kind of had our own approach to the workforce. Um, I would say that before, you know, the pandemic, before some of the, the, the things that happened during the pandemic, uh, we were not keeping our eye on diversity. We kind of had some metrics, but they were not that effective. Um, so I think, you know, although hindsight's 2020, um, that's something before the pandemic that, that was a challenge for us. Um, and that during the pandemic, we realized we need to take some more action. Excellent. And I'm, I'm happy that you shared that, Janet, because uh, you are also bringing to light the small business perspective on things. So very much appreciated. Digna, uh, I can repeat the question, but in, in short, what were some of the key challenges that your organization faced prior to the COVID-19 pandemic? So um, I lead the talent services division at NASA, and we have responsibility for um, the talent acquisition, talent development, and talent management for the NASA workforce. Um, before the pandemic, as a federal agency, we obviously had challenges in competing with the aerospace industry in um, pay and compensation, right? We can't quite pay what private industry um, pays their workforce. And so that is a challenge that we had before the pandemic and one that honestly still is something that continues today for us. Um, recruiting and growing a diverse and skilled workforce is also a challenge that we have been working on for a long time. Um, and diversity from all components, right? Gender, ethnicity, um, veterans, individuals with disabilities, just all different components of diversity. And um, the additional challenge that we've had as part of being a federal agency and living within the compliance requirements that Mike probably knows a lot about as an attorney. Um, we have certain processes that need to be followed when we are hiring civil servants into the government. Our processes are longer than um, private sector industry. And so we have some of those challenges as a federal organization, federal agency. Thank you for that and for painting um, at least a perspective of some of those challenges that uh, I believe, as you correctly said, still uh, persevere <laughs> into the future. 
Mike, can you share a little bit about from your perspective, please? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll speak to not necessarily uh, the Aerospace Industry Association, which is sort of a small group, but really in in our job and looking across the aerospace and defense uh, supply chain and the and the and the industrial based workforce. And so, you know, sort of pre COVID, we had a few trends. Um, they kind of sit in two big buckets. And so, when I talk about things, I'll probably kind of refer to this. You you have a STEM based workforce you know, sort of four-year degree, uh, uh, that type of work. And then you have a lot of skilled technical labor workforce. And so some slightly different issues, both pre-COVID and post-COVID, when we think about those two types of workforces, um, but sort of overall pre-COVID, you you are already seeing pressures on, um, you know, new employees, employee movement, as well as a retirement wave, right? Sort of we're always, we were always talking about that we're on the verge of this major retirement wave. And so I think as we, as we talk about sort of what the impacts of COVID are, what we started seeing was really an acceleration of some of these same trends that we were already starting to see pre-COVID. Excellent, excellent points. And I think you touch upon some of the recurring uh, pain points that we have in the aerospace industry when it comes to these uh, these elements that you highlighted for us. Now, we have talked a little bit about the challenges uh, pre previously uh, and before the COVID pandemic, but in your view and from your perspective, did any opportunities unfold as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? And Janet, we can start with you. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think um, it, there was an opportunity for us. Um, I mentioned diversity and, uh, you know, before the pandemic, we were measuring it. Uh, during the pandemic, it allowed us, I think, to take a bit of a pause. And, you know, we're a Malcolm Baldridge award-winning company. And the way Malcolm Baldridge, you know, framework works is you have your processes, you have your measurements, and when you get your results, you kind of go back and look at, okay, what are we not doing right in our processes? And so it did give us an opportunity to, to look at our diversity metrics and go, hmm, you know, we're, we're not really where we want to be. So what do we do about that? Um, we, we found that there's a large talent pool that we just really haven't tapped into. And that was happening, not just at the small business level, but really across industry at large, especially the aerospace industry that we've been sort of insular over the years um, and we just haven't diversified, you know, the workforce. So that gave us an opportunity to step back and decide what we want to do. So we did, we did a couple of things. Um, one, I would say there was a bit of top down, you know, Hey, let's take a look at this, but there was a whole bunch of bottom up. We, we had a diversity uh, equity and inclusion working group stand up on its own. It was organically stood up. Uh, they want to have an influence on how we make decisions at the company. And we did started doing equity analyses for pay. So we started looking at every engineering grade. Uh, we would look at like the average white male salary. And then we would look at diverse, either gender diverse, ethnically diverse, and uh, make sure that everybody was within, you know, plus or minus 5% of the average white male salary. And then we started developing metrics that we tied to our bonus plans. And so I would say that uh, as a Malcolm Baldridge company, I can tell you that most of that worked. I'm not happy with the metrics and the results yet. So we're going to do another cycle of learning that we call it, uh, because right now we're we're not where I want to be, but we know where we are and we, we have some ideas on how to, how to move the needle. So... I think that's really, you know, for us, it was the opportunity to to pause and really rethink what, what we're doing, which is hard when, you know, when you're running around and catching airplanes. So for about a year and a half, we we're all pretty stationary and we could do some of that thinking. Yes, an excellent point, uh, Janet. And I think the reflection point that you underline is so vital for us to rethink maybe the ways we've done things. And uh, I also love the fact and the, uh, uh, the honesty in your answer saying that we're not where we, we want to be. And there's, I think with all of these topics, this element of aspiration to not ever be done because there's constantly a, a dynamic landscape you're, you're working against. And of course, the diversity in people and technologies and everything, the myriad of factors that are involved in that certainly impact that. But 
uh, a, a key takeaway here is that there is definitely uh, room for learning, but you already implemented some uh, important steps, and I'm very glad to hear that um, from you. Digna, I can imagine that these challenges, similarly to what uh, Janet has uh, elucidated to, are maybe more severe when it comes to a much larger organization. Is that true? And if you if you can expand a little bit on the opportunities that you have seen at NASA as part of going through the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll talk as well a little bit about the diversity challenge that we have in the aerospace industry in general and um, some of the actions that actually um, shifted our strategy. Um, around recruitment um, as a result of the pandemic. So as most people are aware, um, the way that we used to recruit in the past, and we're going back some to some of that, is attending job fairs, right? We would attend job fairs to try to um, identify um, applicants that have the skills um, that we're looking for. With the pandemic, that all went away. So we were all at home and we were not be together in big um, events um, doing recruitment. So we shifted our recruitment um, activities to leveraging digital platforms to reach the workforce that we were looking to recruit. So we use platforms such as Twitter, X now, um, <laughs> LinkedIn um, uh, to reach out to participants of SWE, the Society of Women Eng Engineers, NSBE, right? Those um, different engineering networks and communities that um, have the skills and the diversity that we are looking for for our workforce. And we um, have significantly increased when we look at our applicant flow data, the um, diversity of our applicant pool. Um, so we're very pleased with how the pandemic made us rethink what we were doing and um, helped us to expand the applicant pool that we were reaching out to and recruiting for NASA positions. The other aspect that also significantly shifted for us is um, focused on the development of the workforce. So. Again, um, development of the workforce took place in the past before the pandemic on site at classes, right? We had um, opportunities where folks would um, sign up for um, classes and they would come in and we would all be together learning on different topics. That could not continue under the pandemic. We spent two years at home. So we shifted our um, talent development strategy to um, be aligned with the 70 2010 learning model that talks about um, adults learning best with hands-on learning and activities that help us be engaged in the work that we do. So 70% of our learning should be around doing something or doing work that helps us learn. 20% um, should be of the, our learning could be done by being part of a network, engaging in mentoring, coaching, right? People who do that type of work and we can learn from them. And then 10% um, with more traditional learning opportunities like on-site or webinars such as these. And so during the pandemic, we changed our learning strategy as well to be more focused on um, how we provide employees the opportunity for internal mobility to do different things as part of the NASA team to leverage our internal networks from a perspective of how do we um, address the knowledge management challenges that we have in our agency and obviously leveraging a lot, a lot, a lot of our um, webinars and seminars that we can um, do online that actually allow for our learning to be much more diverse because in the past, you we have 10 NASA centers. Most people are familiar with Johnson Space Center in Houston Houston, we have a problem. Kennedy, where we launch um, our um, missions. And um, we moved to a digital way to grow, to develop the workforce. And that allowed for an engagement and interaction 
of our employees that work in San Francisco at the Ames Research Center with employees that work at Langley in Virginia. So it allowed for much more um, connectivity of the workforce. And um, so the pandemic made us rethink some of our own processes for recruiting and growing the workforce that we are still using today. Wonderful. You pointed to so many uh, important uh, factors and I love the fact that you also highlighted the geographical disparities and how NASA has decided deliberately to try to target that and create a sense of culture and interdependence in that context. So this is this is really interesting and to hear. And I, I can also see that it's a it's a challenging task, certainly, to pivot from what we used to do before and into this new type of uh, digital presence. But nevertheless, I think based on what you described, it, this is uh, really fantastic uh, progress so far. And I'm sure that there are many more elements coming in the future. Um, Mike, how do you see this? And wh how what is your take on, on some of these uh, t topics that have been discussed? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, looking, looking at the optimistic opportunity side, um, you know, but I can't dismiss COVID brought incredible challenges uh, to the workforce and that are that are still being worked through, right? We, we haven't we haven't gotten through them yet. But um, sort of like NASA, uh, most of industry um, had to adapt uh, on the on the human resources front, on the um, recruiting front, uh, and really thinking about how do we look at existing processes that were in person based uh, and accomplish them virtually. Uh, so, um, you know, sort of one small example that I thought was really interesting that we saw occur across uh, the aerospace uh, landscape is an increase in the ability to get uh, virtual inspections and virtual approvals of different things in in the in the supply chain, and actually getting the government uh, to to be a part of that. And actually, NASA was a big partner working with um, the Department of Defense's folks that do this uh, to to try to figure out ways to do some of these approvals virtually when we weren't allowed to do the, the amount of traveling. Um, but I'll say, you know, why this has been such a challenge sort of overall to the workforce is you got to realize on the skilled technical workforce, they're building things, right? They're, they're, they're working machines, they can't work from home, right? And so um, throughout, the co throughout um, you know, COVID, you had tens of thousands of people working every day uh, as essential workers, uh, as part of our industrial base. And so um, that workforce has continued to work through that We've seen great pressure on that side um, with retirements, uh, with with movement across industry. And so we're still working through much of that. Yes, and thank you for pointing that out, uh, The really the valiant efforts by that specific portion of the workforce uh, to keep the really the wheels turning. And of course, in, for instance, in manufacturing, in many cases, it was really unavoidable from them to work from home. Similar thing goes for pilots, I guess, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, uh, remote piloted uh, commercial airliners yet. So uh, again, the, it's it's very interesting to point these elements out that um, while this is a, in aerospace industry has many commonalities, there's also other uh, factors involved here where you can see significant differences. Now I wanna go, and maybe piggyback to one of the points that um, Digna made regarding knowledge management. And in your view, do, do the people who join the aerospace workforce now, are they prepared for the job at hand? Maybe we start with you, Janet. Well, that's a, that's a broad question. It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think, I think yes, to some degree. And I think to some degree, the aerospace industry is not ready for the graduates either. Um, one thing I would say is uh, when I talk to a new grad and I talk about some of the tools we're using, um, they're still, they're not the state of the art. Uh, so some of the kids coming out of school really, you know, have been, have been using state of the art uh, tools. So um so I think the real question here is, are we ready for the graduates? Are we ready to open up that pipeline for all the different disciplines that we need? And, you know, specifically, I spend my time now thinking about space and our whole company is, 
is about space, but um, I'm just looking at some of the the opportunities that are that are coming out. Some from NASA, like um, commercial space station, um, cis lunar operations. Um, of course, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, and mo a lot of us want to go with you know see what it's like out there. But those are huge, big, you know, things to go do, and we do need. Um, young people who think differently, who can work, you know, at a different pace um, and aren't maybe inhibited by the past, um, you know, maybe the risk aversion of the environment that I grew up in, uh, you know, when we, every launch had to, you know, had to be just right and they cost so much money and now they're a little cheaper. So, so yes, I think the workforce is ready. I think, are we ready? And what do we need to do to, you know, make these young people successful so that when they get to, you know, towards the end of their careers, they've been able to achieve the the things that we're dreaming about today. Excellent. And thank you for pointing that out, that it's just not a one sided uh, viewpoint that we can have and that the industry also need to embrace uh, individuals with new perspectives and it, it, I'm actually going to follow up this question uh, a little later, but before that, I go to Digna to see if, if uh, they see that the people joining NASA are ready for the challenges ahead. We do see a great pipeline coming into the workforce. We um, invest a significant um, effort in um providing internship opportunities for students to come join the NASA workforce and be part of our teams um, to grow that skill set. And whether those students decide when they graduate to join the NASA team, if there's an opportunity for that, or um, contribute as part of the aerospace industry, we think we are contributing to the overall health of the um, workforce um, from the perspective of having students come through the agency and um, experience how NASA does business. Every year we have close to 2,000 students coming into NASA in some level of um, internship opportunity, whether one that is for a semester or um, some of our students are with us for a couple of years before they graduate. We um, consistently see what Janet referred to, just folks that have really um, been exposed to um, the most recent thinking around um, technology, how to do business, artificial intelligence, just all of those things that we are focused on. And so um, we are very pleased with the early career hires that we are bringing into the agency. They contribute immediately to our mission. Thank you for sharing that, uh, uh, Digna. Mike, how do you see this? So I'm going to focus on the skilled technical workforce side. I, I know we, we talked a bit about uh, more of the of the uh, sort of STEM folks work, and there, it's actually an incredible opportunity, right? There, if you have a if you have a willingness to learn and you want to work in the the coolest industry, you know, obviously that you can um, space, uh, we want you, right? And so the way it's structured is, you can go get an apprenticeship or uh, at a community college or directly at a, at, a, at a company where you're getting paid to learn. Um, and you actually, as you work through your way, you can end up in a full-time job, earning money, earning really good pay and on the pathway to, to a, a, a very steady career um, just with the interest to learn. So it's actually, the situation on that side is we've been building and there's a lot of work going on here and a lot of more work needs to go on here to sort of build this pathway that if you have the interest and and willing to put in the training, you actually get to do it on the job, which is which is a pretty a pretty neat opportunity. Yes, and thank you for pointing that out because many times people, uh, I've I've spoken to many people who said I don't really know where to start. I mean, it's it's rocket science and it's so complicated. And I love the fact that you uh, just shared with everyone that it's actually possible to learn on the job and. There is obviously this element of you being willing to learn, and and but there is also the opportunity of getting paid to learn, which is which is very unique and very interesting. I think we have arrived at a point where for the Q and A, I have 
of course, tons of questions uh, additionally to uh, ask you here, but um, let let me start with the one of the questions that came in through the uh, our QA portal here. And the question reads, what is the most demanding area of employment in the next 10 years in aerospace and defense industry? Any specific specialty area of expertise? That's the question. Yeah, I mean, I could I could jump in on this one. So, um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, or maybe BEA, one of the one of the Department of uh, uh, of Labor uh, or Commerce entities here, uh, space is a fantastic area to go into, right? So, uh, in the next ten years, it's assumed to be about three percent job growth nationwide. Um, the space industry is assumed to be about double that, about six percent. Um, where are some of those real needed pressures? One is on the technical workforce I talked about. Um, also engineering, particularly software engineering, actually on the software side um, and, and sort of software engineering side, I think I think the demand predicted there is something like 25% growth. So um, real incredible opportunities uh, in our field versus um, what's believed to be sort of going to be the, the writ large job growth. Thank you so much, Mike. That's a great answer. Uh... Dingna or Janet, do you want to follow up with anything else? I, I would, um, and I'm sure this is, uh, you know, near and dear to my heart because Stellar is a, a systems engineering company. But, uh, and so this is Janet Grandin's view of the world. I see a lot of what we're trying to do in space as a, a, a huge spike in the need for systems engineering. So, yeah, they can grow up as software or propulsion or whatever. But at the end of the day, we have to connect uh, a number of, of technologies together to do what we want to do in space. And um, I think uh, the demand for systems engineers are, is, are going to go up. Excellent. Thank you for pointing that out. Digna, anything you want to add? I will agree with both around software engineering and systems engineering are both um, fields that um, we um, are consistently growing our requirements um, for those skill sets at NASA. And um, one component of software engineering is about is around cybersecurity. That is additionally an area that um, we are focused on and it's highly competitive in the labor market. Thank you. And um, I have definitely seen this shifts and I, I definitely see this appetite for these new uh, type of integration points uh, uh, inspired by my dad when I was uh, four years old to become an aeronautical engineer. Throughout my career, I've just seen how much more you need to kind of uh, master in terms of skill sets. And I think you, um, the three of you, very eloquently highlighted some key elements that uh, people who are interested to get into the field or who are trying to expand their skill sets within the field can uh, tap into. Uh, let's go to our next question. Do you believe that providing leaders and managers additional training for managing a distributed workforce can improve retention and employee satisfaction? And maybe I start with you, Janet, on this one. Sure, yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um... You know, absolutely. So, bottom line, yes. Uh, you know, I took some training during the pandemic on my Zoom presence. I I'm looking at myself now, thinking I could probably do a little bit more of that. But you know, those are there. There's little things you don't think about with a distributed workforce that the pandemic made us think about. I would say the other thing, though, is um, having uh, dialogue about how the distributed workforce is changing because. Um, every couple of months, there's something new, some new dim dimension to geographically separated workforce that I hadn't thought about and is starting to become an issue that I have to go address. So um, I think it's an ever-changing landscape and and training probably gets you partway there, but dialogue and, and staying current um, would, would get you, you know much closer to being on top of it. It's my two cents. Thank you for sharing. And then human empathy is certainly uh, a very uh, valuable in, in those contexts. Digna, do you want to share uh, anything beyond what Janet has? 
Yes, um, we do recognize the need for um, helping our workforce, supervisors, employees work in this new hybrid model, right? That we are uh, remotely located at times from the teams that we work with. And um, we have invested in NASA significant resources in um, providing our workforce insights into how to successfully operate in this new environment. Some of the um, examples that I can share is, you know, as um, Janet um, was talking a little earlier about the EIA, traditionally in the EIA, you see in organizations employee resource groups or affinity groups. We actually established a um, employee resource group at NASA that is for remote workers. So many times those are um, for um, Hispanic employees or African-American employees to come together. Um, we established an ERG for remote employees that help bring together employees who are working in that environment or interested in contributing or learning about that environment to bring that network together within NASA. And um, we do think that there, as Janet said, there's just something that happens every other couple of days that it's like, oh, we haven't looked at that aspect of it. And so um, it is the reality of how work is getting done currently and likely will continue. And so we do need to ensure um, that we are providing the appropriate tools for our workforce to succeed in that type of a hybrid environment. Thank you so much, Dina. Mike? Yeah, I, I just had sort of a different, a slightly different view on, on this, which is it's certainly agree on its importance, but I think part of what we learned during COVID was reminding ourselves of the things we should have been doing in person already, like communicating, right? And I think um, the reminders, and I think through COVID that we had to communicate more in a bunch of different forums, right? And I think that actually helped us in a way that we we should keep that as a lesson learned that had nothing to do with virtual, right? That that should be part of um, you know how we manage, how we lead um, every day, whether a hybrid workforce, remote workforce, or otherwise. And so I think those reminders uh, that the question posed, I, I think, are incredibly important. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And I I like to go back to one of the questions that are really um, I can basically take your uh, line of thinking here and expand it a little bit regarding communication, and that is that. The aerospace industry is uh, facing a shortage um, occasionally in people who are skilled to do the work. And this is very various really reasons for that. But we also have an aging workforce. And in your view, is enough being done to transfer the knowledge from people who will want to retire to the younger workforce members in terms of codified and tacit knowledge? And uh, or is there more that we can do in this industry? And it goes a little bit to the communication that has happened. And the, in the worst case scenario, uh, if we don't do this knowledge transfer, uh, that knowledge is lost. And, and the younger individuals uh, or people who recently joined the, the aerospace industry will uh, really go and miss of all that wealth of information that could actually uh, lead to new breakthroughs or uh, innovations. Janet, what do you think about this? Oh, I, I totally agree. I think um, we, we need to do more. Um, so one thing that we did at Stellar when during the pandemic, I'll just use this as an example, but um, we realized like right off the bat, uh, as soon as as soon as the pandemic hit, I don't know what you guys remember, but uh, everybody took their their intern recs off the the website. They took their new grad web, you know, recs off the website. I had a graduating mechanical engineer at the time. He ended up graduating in in April, and, and you know, the pandemic kind of kicked off in March. And there was there was nothing to apply to, and um, so we put our heads together at Stellar and we said, okay, let's come up with a program. We called it the Star Program uh, for obvious reasons, um, but. Uh, Anyway, what we ended up doing was um, saying, okay, let's let's work with the customer. And NASA was actually our first customer. They're very gracious. And we've done this a couple of times with NASA. It's worked really well. We said, okay, we'll bring in a college grad. We'll pay half the salary. They'll work for us half time if you guys pay half the salary. And of course, they get our lowest rate because they're right out of school. And we had a couple of very progressive 
customers at NASA that said, you know, I'll try that. Um, Ariana Sanchez uh, was our inaugural star candidate. And she now, she's been supporting, I mean, before she, it was supposed to be a one-year program, she graduated before that. So she's now supporting the Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative. She's in the in the STMD, Space Technology Mission Directorate. She's passionate about DE&I. She's very active in, in, our, uh, in our culture. And, and she was number one, and then we brought in number two and three and four. So we've had several, um, but those are the kinds of things that, you know, we, we need to do to bring in more young people because once she was in the company, we had 20 people, you know, immediately available to help her learn and she learned really quickly. So I guess the bottom, bottom line is we need more opportunities for young people, people coming out of college, um, at all, at, you know, all across, uh, industry, small business, big business, um, and just ways to bring them in and get them trained up quickly. Thank you so much for um, sharing that example with us, Janet. Digna? I would say we can always do more around knowledge management. And um, like Janet talked about what they're doing, um, we, and I mentioned earlier, we invest significantly in our um, internship pipeline. About 25% of NASA hires every year are new graduates. And um, we have committed to bringing in that um, early career workforce to ensure that we not only are bringing in the latest thinking across um, the um, aerospace and science world, but also that we are able to transfer the knowledge that our um, engineers and scientists need to transfer to, to our um, new pipeline. And so there is always more that we can do to ensure that we learn the lessons um, from the experiences that our workforce has lived through um, in their careers. Thank you so much for sharing that, Digna and Mike. Uh, I'd say it's, a, it's an absolute, uh, absolute issue, and I'll, I'll focus on. I'll stay on the skill technical workforce side. Of that. That'll be that'll be my team for for this for this webinar, um, right? So much on that side is hands on learning, um, and so you know, often in those programs, you you get trained up uh, in in a community college or an apprenticeship, but then that sort of final phase is on the job, working with those people that have been working on on some of these areas for a long time. And so in some particular fields where you've got sort of decades long experience on, on how to use certain machines and such like that, you have a real critical shortage um, in making sure that next generation is there to be trained. Um, and so um, the answer really is to make sure we get more and more folks in that pipeline so that knowledge can be passed on, um, you know, but before it's lost. Thank you so much, Mike. And I get so many questions here in the Q&A portal and I wish I could, we could actually spend time answering all of them. Realistically, unfortunately, that wouldn't be possible. But I want to go back to one of the key themes that I've seen in the chat here. And Mike, uh, the question is really, where do we identify these type of apprenticeships or these type of opportunities? Is there you know, any pointers you can share for people to get that on the job training? Absolutely. So it's it's actually interesting. So on the skill type workforce, um, I think there's sort of a misconception or a myth that that people move around for for jobs, right? That's true in some segments of the economy, but overall, that's actually not how most people live their lives. Um, and particularly on the skill type of workforce, it's about reaching people where they are, letting them know there's a really good opportunity, and showing them how they can get paid to learn to work and then have a very stable stable job. Um, so the first resource is actually going to be local. It's likely going to be uh, a local community college or a local workforce board. Um, over the last year, we've had the, the opportunity to work with the White House in setting up a set of skilled technical workforce experiments in, in Los Angeles, in the Gulf Coast, and on the Florida Space Coast. Uh, and in those opportunities, we really learned, some le we had some really good lessons learned about the importance of this regional aspect. And so some of the partners there, just you kind of get a flavor of what these groups are. Um, in Florida, it's a group called Space Florida that has a big workforce element to it. In the Gulf Coast, there's a group, um, uh, there, there's a group called uh, the Greater New Orleans uh, Partnership 
and it has an economic development element that then partners with, with community colleges. And then in Los Angeles, it's a group called the South Bay Workforce Board, whose job is to connect community colleges and develop these types of programs. So, um, you know, I, I look, community college is probably your best starting point. Um, and, and there's going to be some program that will probably, you know, kind of find one of these opportunities. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I think internships, for instance, at NASA is another way to get, uh, you know, training, as Janet pointed to. There are many programs, even in small business organizations, where you it's, it's a matter of looking for those opportunities and try to get some form of on the job uh, training or internships. So there's definitely opportunities out there. And uh, we are nearing the very end of our, our session here. So um, first I like to just uh, thank all of the panel members. I'm not done yet. So I'm gonna ask at least one more rapid fire question uh, before we let you go, but uh, your time has been very, very, very valuable to us. And I really cherish your commitment and collaboration in, in, in this webinar. Um, I also want to highlight the fact that if you're interested in additional workforce, uh, aerospace workforce uh, topics, and uh, you like to get in touch with me, you can reach out to me through my email, agohardani at deloitte.com. So uh, I can put you in a specific roster where we can identify uh, new opportunities and share them with you subsequently. So with that, um, we're going to go to our last rapid fire question. And that question is, if you were going to share a piece of advice for a new employee, what would that be? Start with you, Janet. Well, that one's easy. Be bold. And if you're not having fun, make a change. Our industry is too much fun to be laboring at a job you don't like. I love it. Great piece of advice. Digna, how about you? I would say stay curious. There's a lot that not only your peers can share with you and that you can learn about the work that is done in your organization, but also from a technology perspective, constantly pushing the envelope and staying curious is a great trait to bring to this field. Thank you, Digna. And Mike? I just so say be nice, and I and I say that as a joke, you know, half jokingly, but not really, right? Because I think it, the aerospace industry is an incredibly collaborative field, right? It, unlike other fields, you need a team to get big things done, right? There's there's very few things you can do as an individual, um, and as a result, those that work well together with others um, stay in the field. And as you go through the field, you're going to have a lot of different jobs. I mean, we talked about this on this panel, right? How we've worn a lot of different hats. And, you know, I found myself working with, with sort of a lot of the same uh, cohort of people, but all, you know, through five or six different jobs. And I think um, remembering that you're part of a larger workforce, a larger ecosystem where how you treat others really matters, both because that's just a good thing to do, but also because that's how we get things done in, in this field. Thank you so much, Mike. And at this point, I'd like to thank all the panel members for your wonderful uh, for your wonderful insight and for sharing these examples with us and and the people who are joining joining us uh, on the webinar and uh, a special thank to uh, all of you Dina Mike and Janet I know you're very very busy so I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy days and, and, and joining me on this webinar. I also like to thank the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and specifically Ms. Toby Jackson and Ms. Monique Alavi for making this webinar coming to life. Uh, again, if you would like to learn more about uh, future activities in this space, you're welcome to uh, submit an email to me, agohardani at deloitte.com with a subject uh, that reads workforce. And um, with that, I'd like to conclude today's webinar. Uh, I, I really appreciate all of you joining. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get through all the questions, uh, but uh, hopefully we can have a future session in which we address some of those uh, questions at a later point. I wish you a pleasant continuation on your week and thank you everyone.